Hi friends, it's good to be back with you here today. We're going to pick off exactly where we left off yesterday, continuing this seamless narrative through the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. And today we're just covering a couple of verses, verses 23 to 26. And we're going to look at the difference between sonship and discipleship, being a child of God and being a disciple of God. So thank you for being with me here today. I do hope you'll uh, make the decision to make the study of the Bible part of the rhythm of your everyday life. And uh, and if you are here for the first time, then please do hang around at the end and I'll tell you lots of ways you can connect to this ministry and get all the free Bible teaching resources that I make available. So bye for now. Okay, today's talk I've entitled Sonship and Discipleship. Before reading the actual scriptures, just a few verses today, 23 to 26, the Bible does use this term, term sonship. Now, it uses that specifically and what it's talking about being a child of God. The reason it uses the term sonship is not a gender issue, as some may think. It's to do with the fact that it's referring to the, the there is an inheritance due. And the term sonship is applying to the fact that we receive an inheritance as a child of God. So it identifies the fact, yes, we are a child of God, but that there is an inheritance to receive. And we're going to touch on that today. I just thought I'd put that in before we launch out and uh, cover what we're covering today. And I'll begin that by reading the, the verses we're covering today, which is Luke 9, 23 to 26. Verse 23, then he said to them all, so Jesus is talking to the disciples here, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whosoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet to lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Okay, so as we dive back into our teaching, picking up where we left last, ta last time, well, when con considering this and in fact the teachings of the whole New Testament, it's it's crucial to recognize is a difference between what is called sonship here being a child of God and being a disciple in this spiritual journey a child of God a son or a daughter is referring to a child of, dirt, uh, uh, of God as I said in the introduction it's a term that captures in essence the fact that there is a family connection between the Christian believer and father God on the other hand, a disciple is a word that is, well, it's rooted in the Greek word, which means learner. It's almost akin, I know I've said this before, to being a student. The best possible translation, probably the most accurate in modern terms, would be that of an apprentice. It signifies someone who is following someone uh who has more knowledge and expertise in the area, but it also signifies a decision made to make a, karma, a profound commitment to follow and to learn and to copy what that person's doing. And today we're going to use this passage to explore the differences between being a child of God and being an apprentice, a disciple in our faith. To become a child of God, we simply must embrace the only thing we need to do is embrace, faith, embrace and have a faith in Jesus Christ, acknowledge his sacrificial sins for our, for our death and acknowledge that it is his, by his triumphal resurrection that we have victory over those sins. The pathway to this ch child of God, this sonship, which implies the inheritance to come, involves making that profound fundamental choice, a conscious decision to believe and I have faith in Jesus Christ. The distinctive nature of discipleship, on the other hand, is going to be talked about by Jesus here in these verses. And the passages, the passage that I've just read, I believe outlines for us what are the requirements uh, it is, not, not just to be saved, but to be a disciple. And it begins with a, a profound element that is often overlooked 
So we're going to return and look at this verse by verse. People often approach this with three calls within this opening phrase, but I would say the first is, there are in fact four, and the first one, the often overlooked one, is desire. So let's return to the text, and I'll just read for you the opening verse again, this time from the New King James Version, when it says, Then he said to them, If anyone desires, there it is, to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So I actually believe that the first requirement for all of this is a sense of desire. That desire is the forefront, the initial thing that, that then sets us off on this path. That's a choice, a choice to make. We can't be coerced or forced into desiring something. We have to willingly do it. It's a decision that goes beyond anything that can be made compulsory. It's a, 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 the very use of the word desire suggests a deep, intense hunger, a will to want to do this thing. But the hunger here is not like a hunger for food. Uh, it's more akin to, to actually starving a person yearning for sustenance. And likewise, our spiritual desire should mirror that sort of idea of an intense hunger. But in this case, what we're hungering for, what we're thirsting for, is righteousness. The depth of our desire is pivotable because of the lap will determine the discipleship path we walk. It's the desire is the catalyst that propels us all forward towards our second requirement, which is the call to follow me, to come after me. A weak desire, of course, may impede that journey, while that sense of an intense, unwavering hunger and thirst after righteousness, a real intense desire to be like God, to be like the Son of God, that is the thing that will mean we have a meaningful, how can I put this, spiritual advancement into maturity through life. May our desire to follow Christ be the thing that is the driving force of our discipleship journey. And then after that, another requirement is disclosed, and that is for us to deny ourselves. Now, here we go, friends. This is the second of some requirements that very often, I think, are misunderstood because it revolves around us understanding. The thing we need to understand is there is a distinction, a difference here between self-denial and the denial of self. You see, the idea of self-denial, which is very popular in certain wings of the church, that suggests abstaining from specific pleasures or activities, a notion popularized by practices like giving up things for Lent. However, I don't think that's what Jesus is advocating at all here. He's advocating not self-denial in that sense, except, of course, that that is often an offshoot of meeting the requirement for denial of self properly. It is this call for denial of self that is actually going on here. In other words, like our acknowledgement of, of under our understanding of sin, it's talking about a profound shift in our perspective. Denial of self, as I see it, is more about us renouncing our self-will, our self-seeking, our self-assertion, that we are, know the best way or that we know the way in which we can deal with our own sin. It will even involve a denial of self-pity and of self-exaltation, -ex both those aspects on the extremes of our character. <clears throat> in essence, denial of self entails choosing every day God's will over our own personal wants or desires. A, a denying oneself but ultimately, it's about denying oneself as the final authority in the decision-making in our lives. And this transformation, this denial, involves surrendering of self-will to align it with the divine purpose, the divine will of God. And that is a crucial step revealed here on our discipleship journey. Then the next requirement we are told is to take up our cross. So moving on to this third requirement, the metaphor of taking up one's cross is also frequently misunderstood. Contrary to common belief, I don't think it principally is about implying or that we are going to have to endure physical suffering, although of course it may do, or even physical death or the 
burdens of life. Instead, it again suggests a willingness to accept the will of God and go his way every day in your life. Jesus doesn't say, get on the cross. He's saying, take up the cross. This nuanced language is pointing towards an ongoing journey, towards the crucifixion of self, acknowledging that we are in a process every day by doing it every day. So it's a process. It's not the destination. The conventional interpretation equates taking up the cross when many wings of the church were suffering pain, persecution, shame, shame, even humiliation. Now, that's a completely plausible understanding, given the historical context out of which this focus on this aspect of taking up the cross emerged. However, an alternative, a wider interpretation that I believe, albeit I accept a majority view in some wings in the church, proposes that taking up the, the cross is primarily about accepting the will of God. It's synonymous with that. Now, of course, see that other things may very well go along with it, but the main core of it is, I believe, accepting the will of God alongside accepting any of these negative consequences that might come out of it on occasion. This interpretation, I think, reframes the narrative slightly, suggesting that taking up the, the, the cross then becomes a self-choice, an active surrender, not just responding to circumstances outside of yourself of which you've got no control. It's about you willingly, by purpose, by decision, aligning yourself with God's will, God's divine purpose, and making that choice to do that every day. It encourages us, therefore, to embrace the challenges uh, alongside, you know, not just the negative things, the joys as well that will come from following Christ. Now, while the majority of, of, of the reality of it may be associated with suffering, it's worth com uh, contemplating that it's also, I believe, absolutely f referring to the good things in life too, and also living a life in which you're willing to simply walk in obedience, embracing God's plan for your life no matter what, and taking pleasure in doing that. So in the rest of this passage, we'll explore the implications of what this teaching on discipleship means. Now, if we revisit and replace this passage we're looking at today in the context of what we've just previously discussed and studied yesterday, I'll just go back to that a moment when Jesus was teaching and talking with his disciples. It's the same passage, remember? We just broke it up and did some of it yesterday. He had this conversation with these guys and he said, who do you say that I am? Do you remember that? And after receiving various responses, Jesus turns and asks Peter in verse 20, who do you say I am? And Peter replies, you are the Christ of God. However, remember that Jesus immediately then cautioned them not to disclose this revelation. Instead, he shares this profound truth with them. And he says, OK, knowing that, know this, that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and raised on the third day. So here we go. The revelation that follows this disclosure was him unveiling the essence of the journey that he will make, which will be one of persecution, suffering, and the cross, in which Jesus, in doing that, is identify him himself in, uh, uh, in uh, how shall I say it, recognizing God's will for him. So Jesus is, in essence, communicating to them. Uh, we looked at it yesterday. He's saying, look, this is who I really am, and this is what God's plan really is for me. So he says, hold on on spreading any good news about my messiahship, as it's not yet time for that full revelation of the positive side, if you like, to be made. People will misinterpret it if they only get half the picture. Instead, he says, understand that the next step on God's agenda for me is going to involve suffering. It's going to, in fact, involve his death, but of course, his resurrection also. So it is with this backdrop that Jesus then addresses his disciples, and he says, okay, if you want to be my disciples, if you want to follow me, for you too, it's going to mean these things, including taking up your cross. So for us too, it's talking about us choosing 
to to make daily choices to to follow him no matter what regardless of persecution suffering but in all things daily to adhere to god's will to make that part of our consistent daily choice in going forward another requirements here the fourth one it is to follow me now that seems fairly straightforward doesn't it following someone simply implies trust and obedience so d disciples here are called to renounce the chosen path that they felt they were on and now step into and follow the footsteps of Jesus as their leader and doing that by trusting and obeying in him. Now following someone by nature involves a degree of trusting and obey. Discipleships are called to, to renounce their chosen paths and simply trust and obey in him. An analogy that captures this for us is the childhood game Follow My Leader. It was a game we played frequently at Sunday school and at the thing called the Boys Brigade that I was in as a child, but I never really understood that it was being used as a metaphor for life at that time. In that game that we played, trust was paramount. The leader would take us over an obstacle course and if the leader jumped over something, a chasm or a bridge, or you had to and the thing would be, would you be brave enough to it and would others in the team encourage you and help you to do it? So when Jesus says, follow me to these guys, it's an invitation to trust in him and to obey him. And there is that hymn, isn't there? It's just popped into my mind. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. So to trust and obey and follow him, there's no other way in which you and I can be a disciple. You see, a disciple, in spite of its words, in spite of the terminology about being a student or being a uh, an apprentice, it's not just about acquiring knowledge. It's about choosing to engage in hands-on activity, living the hands-on experience of working the same way and doing the things that the teacher does. Now, Christians sometimes, it seems to me, just content themselves with acquiring knowledge, but it falls short when it comes, but they can fall short when it comes to putting that knowledge into practice. That's what we're doing here, of course. We're applying, we're, we're studying the Word of God, but my prayer and I trust is that you are implying, applying what you've learned, what we learn together in some aspects of your life in serving other people and serving within your local Christian community. Okay, so having clarified this requirement for discipleship, let me summarize it quickly. It's about having a desire, first of all, to do this, which then enables and empowers you to live the life of denial of self, of self, daily and diligent execution of God's will, choosing his will over your will, and doing that with unwavering trust and obedience to the Lord. Now, that explanation, that journey, that description given by Jesus here to the disciples aligns seamlessly with the broader teaching across all of the New Testament as seen in the epistles and letters that will follow because they all at core emphasize the centrality of first of all discerning and then following the will of God. So the critical question arises out of that if we're called to do this by Jesus, we're called to become children of God and to become disciples, is the discipleship aspect of this optional? In other words, can you be saved? Can you attain salvation without choosing to embrace a full life of discipleship thereafter? Well, I know it's controversial to say so, but I believe it is so. We shouldn't. It's not recommended, but it is possible. Being a child of God and receiving the gift of eternal life through Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ, I believe is completely distinct from the path of discipleship because the path of discipleship is not an event, it's a journey. It involves a more significant personal cost and decision making that takes place beyond the point of our salvation. Discipleship is an option in the sense that it involves us 
and gives us free will to choose the level of commitment and the level of sacrifice that we make beyond the initial gift of accepting the gift of salvation. However, we only have to look around us to see that the level of commitment on that discipleship course varies greatly from person to person, doesn't it? I know that some out there do teach that discipleship is a pre-requirement for recognizing salvation, and it is a notion that I have to be honest and say I don't personally accept. The distinction with between sonship, salvation, becoming a child of God, and discipleship remains clear to me. Accepting the gift of eternal life is one thing, choosing thereafter to walk the path of, the path of discipleship and the level at thereafter of commitment is something, is quite another. Consider the following, different levels of commitment are seen out there. And what it implies here in this verse when it talks about if you don't live this life and don't make these choices and don't pursue your the will of God and instead pursuing your own desires. It talks about ending up losing your life here and I, the internal significance of that. But I don't believe that this verse is implying anything about a loss of salvation. Rather, I think it's referring to a missed opportunity, an opportunity to develop and enhance the, and enhance the gifts that God has bespoke bestowed upon you. It's missing out on the opportunity to have a life that is enhanced by living in the meaning and purpose of God. So on the contrary, losing your life for Christ's sake, in other words, what's talked about here, is about surrendering your personal aspirations for God's will. It's the whole context of the whole passage together. Ultimately, it ties this whole passage up together with this profound question, what profit is it that one gains the entire world which loses their, but lose their own soul? Now, that's a very famous verse, but ironically, it's better translated and is recognized and translated these days in, uh, in, in most modern translations. What's the point in gaining the whole world but losing your sense of self? And I think that's really what's going on here. The emphasis is not the fact or the threat of losing your salvation, but it's about thinking about forfeiting the eternal rewards and commendation from God, both in this life and the life to come, if you're not choosing thereafter salvation to live in accordance with the will of God. In the subsequent verse, the discussion swifts towards the concept of reward, underscoring the internal perspective of what this discipleship journey begins and the potential loss in life of what we gain if we make the wrong choices thereafter. And we are reminded that for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed and when he comes into glory and his Father with the Father and the holy angels. So here again, we are being presented with a choice, an option for each individual. It's a decision-making process. The discipleship pro program, the discipleship journey is acted out in free will. It's not forced, it's voluntar voluntarily, but he speaks of a future event where the consequences will, will, will be made uh, plain to us and that event is when we will stand before the Father. Now it's crucial to understand that this scenario that unfolds before us is occurring at what something uh, that is referred to as the judgment seat of Christ and this is distinct and different from the great white throne judgment that awaits the unsaved. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers and it's not there to determine whether or not you get into heaven. That has been earned at your point of salvation. Rather, it addresses the believer's rewards and talks about the losses that they will have experienced in this life and when they get there into, into heaven. And when it mentions Jesus being in, in ashamed or embarrassed before the Father, it's essential to understand that this phrase is wrapped up within the judgment seat of Christ, the weighing of a person's life and their discipleship journey, not the great white throne judgment that awaits the unregenerated. And again, it underscores the idea of surely wanting to be motivated to live a life where we can stand in front of him, not ashamed, of looking back at the life that we have in fact chosen to live.
You see, even this passage itself is referred to and couched within the term of children of God. It's about children being embarrassed for what they've done in front of the Father. And the embarrassment pertains to the Father looking at the life and evaluating our life's choices and how they, in fact, aligned with God's will for us. And it's only at that point we will be able to truly see and regret the wrong choices that we made. But it's nothing, friends, nothing, I believe, to do with salvation. Jesus is, is actually trying to get us to focus on the potential of, of the rewards alongside the things lost. Salvation is a gift, but rewards and lack of rewards implies something else completely dumb, different, something that can be earned and, desert, and, and, and given in response to our free will choices. I think all of this emphasizes for us the immeasurable value of a life, <laughs> excuse me, lived in accordance with God's will, choosing to choose that over any potential worldly gains, alongside the price he was willing to pay to allow us to have that opportunity. That should be a sobering thought. Many individuals who have trusted in Christ will find themselves embarrassed at the judgment seat of Christ on what they chose to pursue in life. Because the reality is, as it says elsewhere in Jesus' preaching, much of what we invest our time in will not stand the test of time. It'll rot, it'll rust, it'll go up in smoke at this, at this reckoning point. So in summary, friends, those of us who choose to follow to be a disciple of Christ should be marked by a genuine desire to follow him, to deny ourselves, and to diligently, daily execute God's will and faithfully follow him no matter where it takes us. That, my friends, will not only mean that we have, of course, had our salvation, but that we will be rewarded for choosing that direction, not only in this life, but in eternity, the life to come. A reward that surpasses anything that the world can provide for us. The core here, friends, is there is a distinction between being a child of God and discipleship. Being a child of God is about being adopted as a child of God and being saved, and that is received through faith in Jesus Christ. Discipleship, however, involves us willingly taking up our cross, taking up the life of denial of self, and instead being obedient to Christ and the journey he wants to take us on. But remember, that journey begins with desire. So the question is, after your salvation, if you've come here today and you know you're a child of God, you've accepted in faith that Jesus died for your sins, the question is, how badly now do you want to live the life of the disciple? What price are you willing to pay to live this life? Now, this principle actually applies to all aspects of life. And certainly in the, in, in the context of discipleship, the universal principle, I think, of what it means to be human holds true, especially here. When thinking about concluding what I was going to say today, a sort of parable dropped into my mind. I was thinking about how I could illustrate this with a story or a picture. And during a reflective moment, a, a unique idea came to me. I wish it would come more, it would happen more often, but it did on this kind. The scenario that ran through my mind uh, as a picture of this is suppose your father was a really wealthy man and his ultimate goal, his desire was to design a boat uh, in which you could win the world's most prestigious uh, yacht race, the America's Cup, imagine. So having set his sights on that being his objective for you, he wants you to follow in his footsteps and equip you to receive that reward, to hit that goal. So he genuinely disposed, gives you a boat, a wonderful boat of his own design with a working manual and everything about it says that it's got a potential to win this coveted prize. He offers to train you 
but there is one condition that you have to follow the manual and you have to make the endeavor the top priority in your life so you have a choice don't you you can have a choice the boat is given it's a gift you can take that boat and do with it what you will let's think about the scenarios that you can you can the decisions you can make you could actually take that boat you could ignore the, the training manual. Instead, you could transform it into a sort of a party boat, couldn't you? You could focus it on it being a place of pleasure. And then the purpose of the boat and the destination of that, where that boat was meant to go, what it was meant to do, will be lost in the facilities. The second thing is you could start out with good intention. You could try and fulfill the father's wishes, but you find that you lack the necessary discipline or that when you first launched off, you didn't take the manual and very soon you got lost along the way. Despite hearing your father's advice and having the information given on how to win the race, uh, you struggle to follow through a, because you don't refer to the Father's instructions, but ultimately because your lack of deep, committed desire. But there is a third option, isn't there, friends? There's a third option for all of us. It's to create a profound, profound desire to win that prize for the Father, because you know he will be proud of us and will say, well done, good and faithful child. Diligently, you could follow every instruction that he's given you. You could use your Father's manual, and guess what? It is that strategy that will help you, and that is the only strategy that will help you emerge victorious in the end. We'll leave it there today. Thank you for being with me. Okay, thank you for joining me today. I do trust you're enjoying our journey together through the Bible, whether you've been here for the first time or many times before. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you if you've in any way done anything to, uh, to, to tell people or share this with anybody else. The main way this podcast grows is through personal recommendation, people liking it or sharing it on those internet places that they exist on. So thank you for being with me and doing that. I do hope you're finding, well, I do hope you're getting as much out of this as I am. It's a massive commitment. The plan is, Lord willing, to work through the whole Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, which means new episodes, a minimum of five days a week, if uh, I can just keep this up. So thank you for your prayers, for your encouragement. If you want to receive the free resources that are available, there should be an episode notes page and a full transcript of each individual episode. If you're not seeing them where you get your podcasts from, well, that's fine because there's lots of platforms that people subscribe to and receive this podcast from every week, but not all of them will allow active links placed within the, the podcast description. But you can visit us at the Bible Project at buzzsprite.com where you'll find links to those episode notes and transcripts. Everything I produce in this daily Bible project, daily podcast, is in the public domain, freely available, free for you to use at no cost, in whatever way helps you on your discipleship journey. And if you've got a moment, why not think about visiting us on Patreon? That's the place where a community of people uh, can connect with me personally, send messages through there, but also can participate in helping support this ministry be free to the vast majority of people who want it. So either way, thanks again for being with me today. Do come back again very soon to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Bye-bye for now.